Good evening. Uh, it is good to be here, and uh, it's been a, I want to extend my thanks to Pastor uh, Tony for inviting me uh, to give the uh, prayer meeting devotional and uh, bring my greetings from Jordan Valley Church, uh, where I'm the pastor, and uh, we uh, love Amos. Uh, he served with us for three months in his internship, and through him, we love uh, this church, and we pray for you all, and uh, you all are on our hearts. Uh, it's also been a joy to teach the hermeneutics class, which, uh, if you're not familiar with that term, it is, you know, how do we study and interpret the Bible? And I see that many of my hermeneutics students are here tonight, which is always a little bit dangerous uh, for the teacher to then be preaching for I might find myself being evaluated by my own students <laughs> and how well I do what I've told them to do. Uh, but it's a joy to be here. Uh, I'm going to read from Exodus 19, verses 14 through 25. Exodus 19, 14 through 25. Uh, I'll confess, this is, uh, I preached this sermon this past Sunday at Grace Baptist Nairobi and uh, have tried to whittle it down a little bit and focus it, and I think it will be applicable uh, for tonight. Let's begin Exodus 19, starting in verse 14. So Moses went down to the people. He consecrated them for worship, and they washed their clothes. He told them, get ready for the third day, and until then abstain from having sexual intercourse. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed, and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn, and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. Then the Lord, said, then the Lord told Moses, Go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to see the Lord, or they will die. Even the priests who regularly come near to the Lord must purify themselves so that the Lord does not break out and destroy them. But Lord, Moses protested, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. You already warned us. You told me, mark off a boundary all around the mountain to set it apart as holy. But the Lord said, go down and bring Aaron back up with you. In the meantime, do not let the priests or the people break through to approach the Lord, or he will break out and destroy them. So Moses went down to the people and told them what the Lord had said. And this is God's word. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you would speak to us tonight just as... The Israelites here heard your voice and trembled. We ask that through your servant, you would the we all here would hear your voice again. And that you would speak to us through your living word. We pray that through your word, you would do a work of new creation in our souls to build us up to look more and more like Christ Jesus. We pray that your word would be effective and accomplish everything that you have intended for. We pray all this in the name of Christ. Amen. Back this past August, I set out to climb the Twin Peaks with two of the deacons from our church. Uh, so Salt Lake, if you're familiar with it, uh, you can just ask Amos if you have questions. Uh, Salt Lake is nestled uh, right below these very tall mountain peaks. Uh, they rise some 2,100 meters above the city, very massive rocky mountains. Uh, right now they are covered in fresh snow. And I always had wanted, I love climbing mountains, and I'd always wanted to climb all of the peaks that surround Salt Lake. 
And so the trail starts up uh, partway up the mountain, uh, and it's about six kilometers and about 1,500 meters of, of climbing, of vertical gain. Now that's a good bit of climbing, but what made this hike particularly hard was as you got further and further up, the trail disappeared and you found yourself just scrambling over rocks and boulders as you tried to make your way up to the summit. The closer we got, the slower we went. But then finally, after many hours of toil, we crested the top, and down below us, everything just dropped down, and we could see for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, Salt Lake City, the Great Salt Lake, the mountains on the other side. And I, my heart was filled with joy as I climbed this mountain and beheld the world that God has created. We love climbing mountains, many of us, because it's hurt, but you get to the top, and your heart is stuffed with wonder as you behold God's creation. Every single one of us longs for feelings of transcendence. Right? Transcendence is this a sense of something bigger than our own lives, something greater than us, something that lifts, lifts us above ordinary experience. You find transcendence maybe in holding your first newborn baby, and you look at her and are amazed, how did we create this? Maybe you find it in your first kiss, or on your wedding day, or maybe in climbing a mountain. Humans want something that fills our hearts and off present pain and our apathy towards life, and lets us taste, if even just for a moment, something much bigger and more beautiful than what we're used to seeing each day. Well, then we headed down the mountain, and Jake, one of our deacons, who's much more realistic than me, thought that it would take maybe nine hours to do this hike. I thought, no, that's way too long. We can do it in six or five, I bet. Well, we climbed down the mountain, and the lower we got, the more our bodies hurt, <laughs> and we started limping more, and our faces were crusted with salt. And then I sat down in that comfortable car chair and checked the timer on my watch. It was nine hours and 24 minutes. The mountain had broken us. We felt the pain. Every one of us, we live in this tension between wanting something bigger than us, something that lets us taste of God even, takes us out of ourselves, and yet you will also quickly learn you cannot get close to something so big without it humbling you, without it revealing something in you. Mountains fill our hearts, but they also humble us. And it's the same thing with God. There is some aspect in which we want a big God who transcends us, lifts our hearts higher than any mountain, but you realize very quickly you cannot get close to that big God without Him breaking you. And what I want us to see in this passage is that it, it takes a big God to break us, but also to remake us. It takes a big God to break us and then to remake us. So we're going to look at this in just two points. First, the descending and then the cleansing. So Moses has been given instructions for how the Israelites are to consecrate themselves so they can meet their God. And if you know the story of Exodus, you will know that this is the first time that the Israelites get to see something of their God in his glory. Up till this point, Moses has always stood between God and them. God would speak to Moses, then Moses would go to Pharaoh, or Moses would go to the people and say, this is what God said. But now, they get to see their God, they get to see something of his glory. You can imagine the excitement that perhaps they would feel. You can tell that excitement because God repeats this warning. Tell them, don't try to get too close. Don't, they need to view from a distance. I remember when I was, uh, first started dating my wife, and we had our, list, our relationship was a long-distance relationship for the first four months of us knowing each other. It was only over the phone and online. We lived uh, very far apart in our country, and finally we were going to meet face-to-face, -face, and she lived in Los Angeles, and I'd flown into Los Angeles, and both of us were nervous as I got off that plane, and she was waiting for me there. 
Would we still like each other after we saw each other? Our, our stomachs were mixed with excitement and fear. And I imagine the Israelites experienced the same thing, this excitement of being able to see this God who redeemed them, and yet this growing fear of what will he be like. And what I want you to notice first is that as they come to Mount Sinai, and Israel gathers around the mountain, they haven't come to where God lives. No, they haven't come to God's home. They've come to a place where God has descended. That is repeated over and over again in our passage, verse 11. God says, I will come down to Mount Sinai in the sight of these people. On the third day, verse 18 tells us, the mountain was covered in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. Then again in verse 20, the Lord descended to the top of the mountain and called to Moses. And what we have, if you can picture the scene, there is this contrast. There's the Israelites down here, and then there's God who is up in heaven. And in order for those two to meet, God has to descend down to the mountain, but Moses has to ascend up to where God is, while the Israelites stay at the bottom. God isn't making Moses climb up to where he is, where he lives. That would be impossible. You see, the only way that we as humans can meet God is if he first comes down to us. But notice he doesn't come all the way down. And he doesn't go to the bottom of the mountain because that would be bad for the Israelites' health. It wouldn't end well. He would break out and destroy them, as the text says. And so a mountain works well. God can be at the top of the mountain and the Israelites can still see something of what's going on. God's showing us the only way that you will find me is if I first come down to you. You could spend seven lifetimes climbing Mount Kenya and still be infinitely far from where God lives. He's got to first come close to us. Now, when you climb a mountain, it's hard not to feel a sense of worship. You could even be an atheist and, and deny that there is God, and yet you climb a mountain and look at the wonder of and then your heart worships. It's why so many people love to climb mountains. And God here is showing his people, you think this mountain is grand. Guess what? That's my footstool. Wait till you see my throne. The mountaintop, which if we could imagine Moses, he's not a young man at this point, climbing up this big mountain. He's sweaty. His legs are cramping. That mountain that tore you up to get to the top, I had to come down to get to it. Do you realize how big I am? And then as God descends, we have this language, like in verse 16, that there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud formed over the mountain, and there was a trumpet blast. And then verse 18, smoke billowed up from like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. Now that language should remind us of a few other things in Scripture. Maybe we think of Isaiah 6, when, they, when Isaiah gets a vision of God's throne, but I think the primary thing that we should think of is 2 Chronicles 7. The temple has just been constructed, and Solomon offers this prayer of dedication. When Paul in, in 2 Chronicles 7 says, When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven, burnt up the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter that temple of the Lord, because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. You see what God is doing on top of Mount Sinai? He's turning the mountain peak into his temple, his dwelling place. You see the similar language. Now for the Israelites, they grew up in, a, in this ancient culture where there were many, many different gods. Maybe it's similar to some of the beliefs in this region. And these gods there are so many gods, and they could be contained in various idols or religious trinkets. And you would learn what each god liked in order to provide you blessings. And so the way that you would keep your home safe is you would pay someone to fashion an idol for the god that protect, you know, specialized in protection. And ultimately, gods were things that served you. You gave this thing to the god, and now he owed you something in return. I'm going to give this God some food, some bread. He now owes me some blessings. And you could carry these gods around. 
But notice what God is showing about himself here. He's not a God that you can carry around. Mountain can't even contain this God. God shakes the roots of it. This isn't a God that you can just take some of him and put him in your house for good luck. In fact, you get too close to this God, and he will kill you. I'm sure you notice the repeated warnings in the passage. Now, maybe we don't worship idols in the very same way they did back then, and yet, we are still idolatrous. You know, idolatry is any time that you don't worship the God, the true God, Yahweh, the God contained in scriptures, and instead you cut pieces out of that God, form and fashion in him into something that fits you, instead of you submitting to him. And you see, we do that in all different ways. So ask yourself these questions. Has the God that you worshipped confronted you, challenged you, changed your life? Or do you see God as just something you can like pick from the store and use to help improve your life? It has God driven you to change your schedule? Or do you just fit God into the open parts of your schedule? Has God driven you to avail yourself of his means of grace, worship, prayer, and the sacraments? Or do you just fit those things in when they're convenient or you feel like you need a little boost? Has God changed how you consider money and use your money? You give him the first fruits of what you have. Or do you just take what's left over and say, well, this God doesn't care if I give him what's first or what's last. He'll owe me because I've given him something. But you see, the God of Sinai knows our hearts. And he knows whether you give him your first or your leftovers. Has God changed the priorities in your life, in your work, and in your family? Or do you just bring God and set him on the wall or the, the uh, countertop in your house and pull them out when you need some blessings? Has your worship of this God made you look different from those people around you? Your neighbors, fellow students, co-workers? Are you worshiping a God who fills the mountain? Or are you taking a God that you can fit in a bottle? and letting him help you? Has God set the agenda for your life? Or have you brought God in like a coach to help you with your own agenda? And one of the key places that we can do this is when we pick and choose which parts of the Bible we will accept. What do you do with the parts of the Bible that offend you? The parts of his word that rub against you or rub against the culture? you carve those pieces out just like an idol maker and throw them to the side? Or do you realize, no, that I must accept God as God and I'm the one who must be carved out? Where has God and his word convicted you lately? Does every time you read the Bible, you think, oh yes, I know exactly who needs to hear that. Or do you read it and realize that I need to hear this verse? I'm the one that needs to be changed. The God of Sinai will break every single one of us because none of us can stand before him. We are all sinners. A pocket God, an idol, who won't offend you is easily ignored if you don't like what he says. It's like a little mound of dirt that you can climb up without even breaking a sweat. But that God is unable to lead you to change. It is unable to lead you to transformation. And this is this tension, this paradox that we all live in, that every one of us in our hearts, we long for transcendence. We want to have that mountaintop experience. But we realize I cannot get close to the God of Sinai without realizing at the same time how little I am. The big things break us. And so what often humans do is we realize, well, I can't get close to that God, so I'm going to try to find a reflection of God. I'm going to try to find a reflection. Eugene Peterson, the late pastor, wrote, classically there are 
three ways in which humans try to find transcendence, religious meaning, apart from God as revealed in the cross of Jesus. And here's the three ways he lists. Through the ecstasy of alcohol and drugs, through the ecstasy of recreational sex, and through the ecstasy of crowds. These things are so common in the U.S., and I would guess they are common here. People are trying to get an experience of God through false gods. Even we have a number of pastors and pastors in training here. We list one of the things is through the ecstasy of crowds. How easy it is in our ministry to try to feel the transcendence of God based on how many people show up on a Sunday instead of experiencing God as he is and not worrying about these other things. And these things are not the source of glory. They're just things that in one reflect God's glory but often are sinful reflections. And in the same way, if you put a mirror by the fire, you can't get close, you can't get warm from the reflection of the fire. No matter how close you get to that mirror, it will not warm you. And it's no wonder then, as so many of us try to take hold of reflections of God's glory, that we're never satisfied. It's no wonder we're always looking for something more. And that is the tension every one of us lives in. We want to have the experience of standing atop Mount Everest or Mount King. We know that to get there, it would probably kill us. And so we have our second point, the cleansing. Now, throughout this passage, you notice that God tells Moses that the Israelites need to consecrate themselves. This involves washing their clothes, which back then didn't happen very often, and and less so because Israel's been traveling through the desert without much water. So this is a big deal. They're called to abstain from sexual relations, not because sex is somehow, un, somehow unholy, but it's a way to remind them of the seriousness of what they are about to experience. And then on the morning of the third day, Moses leads the people from the camp, which is further out. Now they've washed and cleansed themselves, and they can come closer to the base of the mountain. You can see in our text there's a relationship between how close the people can get and how much they've been consecrated. They start out off, out here. They wash themselves. They, they, they consecrate themselves. They get a little bit closer. And, and, and think about it. That, that consecrate, the, the, the idea is that it means it's belonging to God, God-like. So if you think about it for a moment, the, the idea is that the more like God you are, the more you are able presence. Consecrate something is to remove some of those impurities. And so the people's consecration allows them to come closer, but they still can't climb the mountain. They can't go to the top. And why? Well, because God's glory is like a purifying fire. And so anything that is not God-like that comes and will be disintegrated, will be burnt up. And so the, though the Israelites have consecrated their clothes and washed what God really wants is clean hearts. God wants clean hearts more than clean clothes. And yet so often we tend to think God is satisfied with just an outward appearance. If I'm a good person, if I do good things, well then God, God will accept me. And yet that can never work. These people did an outward cleansing, but all it got them to was the cheap seats for the show of what had to go on. They have a front row seat to God. And if you're treating Christianity just like a list of do's and don'ts, you aren't following the God of Sinai because his do's and don'ts are impossible for you to do on your own because they deal with the heart. And then consider Moses. He is the one who is able to get the closest to God and along with Aaron. And yet even he can only experience God after he has descended to the top of the mountain. Moses gets a toned down version of God. Because a big God will break even the best of us. No one is worthy. And outward washings don't wash your heart. And the bigger the God, the deeper he sees into your heart. The more holy he is, the more your best things start to fall short of his perfection. He is like a bright, bright light that exposes every little speck 
of dirt. So without a thought life, desires, affections, the first thing that you think of when you wake up in the morning that does not perfectly reflect God, His presence will break. 51, 16, 17. David says of God, You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Friends, what if the thing that you fear most, having that exposing light of God shine on your heart, the thing that any one of us would naturally run away from, is what we need most? And that in all of our efforts to create a God that we can manage, that we've cut out the offensive parts about him, who doesn't make us feel too bad, is actually keeping you from what you most need and have a sinking desire that you cannot find in all these things you're trying. Do you want to be made new from the inside out? Do you want to be able to stop hiding your sin and the filth and the thoughts that run through here? Francis Schaeffer wrote, Since the fall of man, we do not want to deny ourselves. Actually, we do everything we can, whether in a philosophic or practical sense, to put ourselves at the center of the universe. That's what sin does. Because I want to be at the center, and God will be at the side. But to be a Christian is to die to yourself and realize that God's rightful place is at the center. But we're afraid of a God that is bigger than us. That's why it is so much easier to worship idols. But only a God that is bigger than you can heal you. Every one of you, and me as much as you, we have a darkness in our hearts, a sin that will not let go, a list of thoughts we don't want anyone to we try in this life so hard to hide those things. I can't let my fellow elders see this. I can't let my congregants see this. I can't let my spouse see this. I can't let my parents see this. Because if people knew what happened in here, no one would want me. And I wouldn't even want myself. But maybe you've also had that sinking feeling that unless I deal with what is down in here, I'll never find freedom. Unless you acknowledge how deep your sin runs, so much deeper than just what you do, you will never be free from that sin. It's like trying to deal with the weeds by just chopping them off, and the next day they've grown up again. You've got to get to the root. Unless you let a big God break you, you'll always be in this living hell of knowing what takes place in here and trying to hide it from everybody else, including yourself. That's why we need this passage. Because what if being broken by a big God is the first step to freedom? And that's why we can't just look at this passage from the perspective of the Israelites, but as Christians who are living on this side of Jesus. Because we can know what the Israelites did not fully know, that the God who loves his people does not break his people to destroy them, but to heal them. Consider Hebrews 12, starting in verse 18. You have not come to a physical mountain, to a place of flaming fire, darkness, gloom, and whirlwind, as the Israelites did at Mount Sinai. He's speaking about this situation here in Exodus 19 and what follows. But then the author of Hebrews, notice what he said, you have not come to that mountain, but where have we come? Picking up in verse 22 of Hebrews 12, no, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in joyful gathering, 
You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God himself who is the judge over all things. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. You see what is repeated in that over and over. You have come. You have come. Come And just as the author of Hebrews is preaching to his congregation, he is also preaching to you here today, brothers and sisters who are in the Lord, that you have come not to Sinai, but to Mount Zion, that every one of us stands with this tension, the sin in our hearts that keep us from God, and continually lead us to do things that we hate. And this feeling that I am incapable of healing myself. And what is the answer? You can go and try to find a God that you can manage, who will not reveal the darkest parts about you, but that God will also not transform you. Or you can come to a God who is so big, He fills the mountain and he brings you to your knees. He slices open your heart and picks up those broken pieces, not to end you, but to turn you into something beautiful, holy in his sight. God is not just a big thing. He is a big God. And he is also a God who loves sinners. He breaks you open so that He can break the sin out of you and wash you and cleanse you and heal your heart. But the only way that you can make it through Sinai to Zion without being killed is if you come to Him in repentance. It means to be vulnerable before Him. Now, I don't know about you, but it is really, really hard to be vulnerable to anybody because You expose the worst parts about you. But there's no one safer to be vulnerable with than Jesus. Because, friends, he has become vulnerable to you. He has said, I will unite myself to these people so tightly that their sin will be my sin. That every time they screw up, it'll be my screw up. And then he walks into Sinai to God's presence, not as the man who lived the perfect life, but as the worst of sinners because he has the sins of the whole world on him. And there, he was broken by God so that we could be healed. And what that does is Jesus then gives you his righteous life. That he gives you his perfection. And he paves a way through Sinai so that you can come Zion and receive him. Behold your God. Jesus has taken your sins down into the grave, never to return again. And so will you humble yourself to realize there is nothing in my hand I can bring, but only to the cross I can cling. Will you realize that the only way that you can be free is to be humbled and broken. And the cost to receive Jesus, on one hand, it is free, but on the other hand, it is so high. It can't be earned by money. It can't be earned by how much you do. It takes something that is way harder, laying down your own ego, laying down your pride, laying down your self-righteousness, and giving yourself to God and saying, let you, God... Break the sin in me so that you can remake me in the image of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we ask that you would do these things to us. Things that only you can do. Things that our idols, the things we worship, these other gods in our lives will never do. 
Father, draw us irresistibly to that grace so that we will not fear your light, but realize that it is the path to our freedom from our sin. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.